so John, thank you very much again for doing this. And I want to start from the very beginning. So you were born in the Cayo grasslands in Clayton, New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. And that, that place has kind of a barren beauty to it that it's kind of like where I grew up in a way. <laughs> and it sounds crazy, the oceans apart, but it does kind of like look like my place. And uh, I'd like to know how was your childhood growing up in such an adventurous looking place? And uh, yeah, I just want to know about it. Um, well, my, my, uh, my dad moved there, moved us there because, uh, that was at <clears throat> that, um, in the late forties and, uh, and he was part of that big group of, uh, of, uh, young college graduates that went out in that part of the country, uh, to teach farmers how to, how to, uh, farm differently. Cause that was the center of the dust bowl. Mm -hmm. And it was still recovering from the Dust Bowl. And uh, so there were parts of it that were really beautiful and other parts that were still just dirt and and um, <clears throat> dust was still blowing around a lot. So uh, uh, one of my first memories as a kid was playing in a cardboard box, a refrigerator box with one of my little buddies and crawling out of it and looking up at the sky and the sky was copper colored because of all the dirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, and gradually, as I got older, uh, it began to clear out more and more. And so it was just uh, so growing up out there, it was a little town, like 2000 people. And it was 90 miles from any place of any size at all. So we were really isolated. But, you know, as a kid, you don't think about those things. It was just uh, my whole world was there. And uh, we had one paved road that went through the the town uh, going off into to Amarillo and Dalhart and uh, and all the rest of the streets were dirt and they just ended up out in the in the nowhere going out into the plains we would go out and dig out and make up you know baseball diamonds out there and play play baseball and football out on the edge of town and mm -hmm. hike and stuff so my my childhood a lot of it was spent outside and uh, uh, because that's, you know, being in the town, you have a certain number of limited number of friends and uh, and uh, really not much TV, not much radio. I eventually bought a little uh, brown plastic radio, clock radio. And uh, and I remember finally getting get turning it on in my bedroom and hearing uh, um, hearing Marty Robbins sing. El Paso mm. wow. and that was an amazing experience for me and and Roy Orbison was on the radio a lot then too so it was wow. a it was a big turning point in my life to start hearing music because I my uh my folks and my brother and sister no, none of them were music musically inclined I don't know where I got it but uh it mm -hmm. was some kind of magic that sort of floated into me and uh and so, um, you know, I just ran with a bunch of kids and uh, played a lot of baseball, a lot of football. We rode our bikes all over the place. And um, uh, in fact, that yeah, that song um, that Kevin and us do called Superman 14. Yeah, Amarillo, and I, the bike. And then I recorded on the Songs for the Modern West. That, yes. That's an uh, album that I made. That was all about that time, that period of time, when uh, when you think you know, you think that nothing is ever going to change yeah. in your life. You know, as a kid, you don't you don't think about that stuff, and then all of a sudden, like with 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 me, when when I was fourteen, um, my dad got a better job in Roswell, New Mexico, or no, in Portales. And so when I was uh, going into my 15th year, we moved and all, you know, I just, all of my, all of my old friends that I had known since I was five and six years old, I they just disappeared from my life. So, um, so that's what that song is all about. And it's, it's, and, um, 
So, you know, that's pretty much my childhood there mm -hmm. in Clayton. Uh, by the way, I think that's one of my very favorite songs. I have it playing on the radio more times than I can count. It's just, it kind of speaks to me in a way, even though your upbringing was different than mine. But I used to play outside all the time with my brothers and my friends. And we had, you know, we used to build uh, uh, tree houses and all that, you know. We still had kind of a old fashioned type of childhood around here because I grew up in a country village and, and, it's, uh -huh. and it's, it consists of uh, 800 people and it's just in the countryside. So uh, we had fun together, hide That's and seek, you know, playing hide and yeah. seek during the summer. Yeah. If you're in a small town, no matter where you are, you know, you're, you're, it's the same experience. Yeah. You have a number of friends and you spend a lot of time outside. We did the same thing. At, uh, one of our favorite places to hike was a place called Paradise Canyon. And it was a three miles outside of town. So we would just pack up a little lunch and then just walk out of town to cross the prairie and spend the whole day out there and then come back by, by nighttime. We had to be back. You know, but they we didn't have cell phones or anything like that, so yeah. we just wandered out there, rattlesnakes and antelope and wild animals of all kinds were were out there on that Great Plains. It, arrowheads and all sorts of magical stuff. I guess I guess that informed you in a way, right? Yeah, it informed how the songwriting, even I guess. Yeah, it it does. It, it does form, you know. Uh, it took, when I first started writing songs, I wrote a lot about that country. And then as I grew as a, in, into songwriting and, and, and wanted to be a musician and went to San Francisco and went to L.A., my writing got away from that because um, because I didn't think people cared about it. And uh, uh, I wanted to write hit songs and I wanted to be famous and I wanted mm -hmm. to band, you know, and I wanted to be touring and I wanted to have a record deal and all of that stuff. So those songs kind of that were part of my soul, um, I I just forgot about that for many years. And, uh, and then as I got older, kind of recovered them again. And... And it's you know, as everybody knows who listens to music and 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 those of us that write music, the closer you you know, the closer you are to your soul and to your heart, really the better songs you write. So I feel like I'm writing better now than I did years ago. Uh, so thank goodness that you went back to the songwriting that you started out with. And yeah, but you know, you, gr you grow like, yeah. um, you know, I, I went through that country rock phase and in the seventies and then, uh, and then one of the, a great, really great turning point in my life as a songwriter was in, uh, when I was in San Francisco and, and, um, in the late seventies and I started hearing all the new wave bands that came out like the police and, and, um, uh, Joe Jackson and mm -hmm. the Talking Heads and all of them, they had a huge influence on me, and uh, and, and in a and in a really good way because there was they their music was so different than anything I had been doing, but I resonated with it because of its simplicity, and uh, and so I wrote some songs back then during that time that that I just and and had a band a, a band together. Um, and that was a really powerful band and the really super energized. Uh, I still have a live show we did in 1979 at the, um, at a club in San Francisco. It's it, when, when I had come in second in a, in a Bay Area wide songwriting contest. And so as a result, we got to do some recording and play a live show at this place with some other bands. And I still have a live tape of that, and it's just, just nonstop 
I would energy. love to hear that, John. I would die like to hear it. Believe me. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you a copy of it. I, I would it's love pretty, to. It's, Man, it's, I would love to. Yeah, it's, it's a. I usually don't like a lot of my. Oh, I mean, there's some. You know, a lot of. A lot of a little, few embarrassing things in it, but it's basically just really great, simple four piece rock and roll new wave stuff and it's wow. it so much fun. So anyway, you know, I um I really felt like I grew a lot as a songwriter during that period of time because because the one thing that going you know with those bands coming out uh and doing playing music a lot differently than than had than had been done before. Um it like paved the way for punk music and punk rock and yeah. all sorts of great music, like by like by groups like X and the Misfits and stuff. And I was sort of right in the middle of all of that. I wasn't. I, I was neither country pop music or I wasn't punk. I was right in the middle of trying to create my own yeah, my own simple musical. sound. Yeah. And uh, and so I grew a lot that way and um and, and a lot of those oh a lot of those ideas and the ways of approaching music i still still nurture or try to find um you've been a musician all of your life you know right and so i, I guess you answered this next question earlier i was wondering what was the very first moment uh uh you remember hearing music for the first time and what piece of music it was, but you already answered with the the plastic radio that you had in your house. So, and... actually, actually, the that that came a little bit later, oh. and I sort of budged on the truth a little bit because when I first heard my first um, kind of real magical experience of hearing music and having it kind of affect me more than just listening to it um and it was was when i was uh we used to come here to tucson from clayton all the time because my grandparents lived here mm -hmm. we were driving back after christmas one one year and i was like 10 or 11 something like that and uh i was half asleep in the back seat looking out the window counting telephone poles and the radio was on and all of a sudden um El Paso came on that Marty Robbins song and I, and that was the first time I really you know that music really sank into me in a way that was that I could never get rid of and I didn't think about being a songwriter then but but uh but I started you know I started to um singing to myself and sing, and I sang I, me and a friend in Clayton we did a uh we did a little uh talent show and sang an Everly Brothers song and and uh and it wasn't until later that I picked up guitar but I took piano lessons and you know so I I just kind of fooled around with it and then uh, um and, and actually I, I haven't been a musician my whole life I went to college and and when I got out of college, I taught school for two years. Oh wow! I didn't know. And, uh, in okay. the late '60s, and uh, and then, uh, but I didn't like it, and so I quit. And uh, and then just started hitchhiking around. I I played with a folklore group out in <clears throat> in Louisville, Kentucky, for a couple of years, and so that that was it. But I was a teacher. That was supposed to be my that was my career and my wow. my dad was just like just so disappointed that i went and i was hitchhiking around i didn't have any money i had a guitar uh you know it was like devastating for him but he eventually got over it <clears throat> years and years later uh, but then so that's of a lot of people you know yeah and especially back in those days right the 60s yeah. like a lot of young people were like going 
uh, around the country and, and trying to discover more about them, themselves that maybe the, the road that had been paved already in front of them by the parents or society in general, they wanted more out of the, uh, their lives, right? And uh, so that makes me wonder when was the exact moment that you realized that music and the arts in general uh, were destined to be like your life, how you would like make a living? When was the moment that you said, you know, I'm, I'm going to pursue this professionally. This is good. This is my life. Well, it, you know, I, I never like when I made that switch, I never thought about it as professional. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, mm -hmm. what what had happened to me is that when I was in college, I had a couple of bands, and I and I also had a little folk folk singing duo with a a, a young woman named Dan Alba and um, Ann McGuffin at that time, and so so I was a lead singer in a a group called the Grim Reapers, and we played in college towns. Uh, we played in our college town in in uh, in Portales, New Mexico, and then we we started opening up for all of the touring groups that came through New Mexico. Yeah. We opened up for the Turtles and Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs and Paul Revere and the Raiders in in towns around. So it was um, in, but all that time I was just uh, you know I was struggling with college and struggling with my own identity and everything. But I really loved being in a band, but I never thought of it as being, well, I could just, you know, I'm going to do, this is going to be my life. It was just something I did in tandem with going to college and becoming a teacher. And then uh, I got out of college and uh, I went to, got a job in California as a teacher in the Valley in uh, Hanford, California, and then, and then continued to write, uh, write songs. In fact, started writing more in my spare time, getting up in the morning. And, and the more I began to do that, um, the more I just teaching was just so dissatisfying to me. And, uh, and then the, uh, the lady that, um, or the young woman that I I had a sang with a, a folk duet in in Portales, she uh, she and her uh, husband had a folklore group called the House of Atreus in mm -hmm. Louisville, Kentucky, and she asked me if I wanted to come out and play with them. And so, mm -hmm. I quit teaching and went out there and joined them. And my wife at the time went with us. But she just hated hated it, and mm. so she ended up going back to California, and I stayed out and played with them, and that was it. And then I quit that after a couple of years, and then just hitchhiked around the country and played music in various places, and and then uh, ended out up in um, eventually ended up in L.A. Yeah. in the in the early seventies, and then. Um, didn't like it, and so moved up to San Francisco and spent almost the whole 70s in San Francisco, and then moved back to L.A. in the 80s. And by all that, by that time when I was in San Francisco, uh, that was when it really, I mean, I, I really worked at making demos and working with managers and trying to trying to get record deals and trying to get publishing deals and really trying to make something happen. But I kind of eased into it. Yeah, um... it wasn't. I get it. Uh, like a light bulb went off and I said, oh, I'm going to be a, you know, I'm going to become famous. I'm going to be a, pro a professional. Yeah, it just kind of uh, gradually happened by you, by your doing, by your playing so, uh, the music. You just kind of eased into it in a way. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the 70s, the 60s, and there was so much groundbreaking music then. And um coming out all the time and uh, I was wondering uh, uh, with so much new music and new inspiration around you musically uh, how did you go about like forming your own musical identity 
And what was the very first song that you wrote, if you do remember? Oh, um, well, um, yeah, you know, forming my, well, the very first song I ever wrote was back in college with Ann, mm -hmm. Ann Duran, I mean, uh, Ann Albin, the girl that I sang with. We wrote a song called the Only Fake Can Guess, and uh, we went up to the Norman Petty Studios in Clovis, that place where Buddy Holly recorded, and... Uh, mm -hmm. And he recorded it for us, and uh, and that was that was one of the first. I mean, I wrote a few songs for our band then, but I never thought about being a songwriter. You know, uh, I just wanted to play music. Yeah. But I, but behind it all was was knowing that you know that the only way you can really go anywhere in 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 music is if you start writing. You have your own identity. And that, and that was a has always been a struggle for me. I've never, you know, I'm like, you know, so many. You you look at bands that are built and uh, and uh, folk singers that come out like uh, maybe they all struggle with their sense of identity too. But I've always had, uh, um, I've always felt like I was like some kind of a chameleon. Where I would just like, I just loved all kinds of music, and I could, I could never. It was really difficult to define myself in any one genre, like mm -hmm. country music or rock and roll or folk music or whatever. It was all I always, you know. I always really loved rock and roll, but I was more like a storyteller and a folk singer. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard for me to kind of merge the two. Because if you're, you know, if you're playing folk music, that's one thing. Uh, you can tell stories if you're playing. Um, if you're playing country music, you can tell stories in your lyrics. But if you, you know, it's really, it's a little more difficult to do that in, in rock and roll and stuff. It's a, a little more. I mean, from my perspective, a little more formulated, you know, and you have you have real hook lines and and you build songs around hook lines and you don't necessarily tell stories. And so I, I struggled a lot with my identity in that way. And uh, and even in my new wave kind of format, like that song um, by the you and Buick mm -hmm. off of the. Um, off of the songs from the modern West. Yep. I wrote that in, in like 1981. And I wrote it as a new wave sort of a song, you know, with an eight note guitar picking. And, uh, and it, and it was like, there, there and that was one of the first, I think successful songs I wrote that, that I, I thought of as being a, having a, the story kind of it's kind of a story that I like, but also having it in a more of a rock format. So, it, you know, my musical identity, I still struggle with it. I mean, I'm working on a new record right now. And, uh, and, um, you know, unlike, I don't know how, how other people do, but I always think of my songs are like all over the place. You know, they, they can go anywhere and they're, they're not like, oh, you know, you listen to, a, you know, yeah. like a Phoebe Fletcher album and all of her, she's, you know, a really young, great songwriter. All of her songs sort of seem the same, you know, and I've all, and it's the same with a lot of folk singers and, and a lot of uh, bands, their, you know, their music all seems to meld together, but mine always seems to be like things, you know, <laughs> kind of pieced together. And, uh, things, right? and yeah, I, yeah. you know, maybe other songwriters have the same kind well, of identity. I but... guess uh, it's good because you're not, you cannot be pigeonholed, right? That's true. I think. Uh, it... but playing with, playing with uh, it's helped a lot playing with Kevin. Uh, because um, 
all of us songwriters, the main ones like uh, Teddy and Park and I, uh, we come from different backgrounds. Like Park, Park comes from a he's he's the youngest of the us three, Teddy and Park and I, yeah. and so. So when he was growing up, uh, I was already kind of playing other kinds of music when he was still listening to some of, you know, some of Led Zeppelin and stuff. And Teddy grew, and so Park had more of a um, a rock, pop rock. Sensibility. Cross country sort of upbringing. Mm -hmm. And Teddy was, Teddy was a, you know, was a, by the time he was 16, he was a sought after blues guitar player. I mean, he was a great blues guitar player and his songs had that country blues kind of feel to them. And I'm a folk type singer. And so, so with us, it's helped us define our music because it all funnels through Kevin. Mm. Yeah. And, and in the beginning with the Kevin Costner and modern West, it was all my music. Yeah. Kevin resonated with that mostly, and then as the three of us began to write, we began to write uh, our musical identity as a group flowed through Kevin, because unless the song resonated with Kevin in a way that he can he can identify with it on on stage, it doesn't work. So so our new musical identity in that band is all funneled through Kevin, and it helps us navigate what type of song we'll we'll present to him or or that we'll come up with but as far as myself goes uh i record some of the songs that we play um i recorded them like long way from home and love is everywhere and all, a whole bunch of songs that i recorded in a in a kind of a different way um but uh those are songs that you know that that uh, have gone through the Kevin Costner selective process. So anyway, so uh, I hope that answers your question about yeah, the musical. It does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, John. And um, uh, w w listening to some of your albums like River of Fire and uh, Already Are and uh, Songs from mm -hmm. the Modern West, I cannot help but feel like um, I'm kind of a Western character on a big American canvas. And I'm saying this like listening with European ears. They just evoke that um, a certain Amer American mythology that I associate with your country. Um, is that like intentional uh, on your part or, that, or does that come out uh, from like the places you grew up, uh, where you have lived, something you have experienced, uh, does that come out naturally or, or is, that, is that something that you sit down and think about, you know, I have to write in a certain way, evoke certain feelings, certain images. It's, it's got such a great cinematic quality, your, your writing. Well, yeah. Uh, no, I just... Uh, um... I just try to, I, I usually in a, making a record or coming up with an album, um, I'll have a certain, some things will be going on in my life that I'll have a certain direction for them. But, but I, um, and I may be writing with certain people, mm -hmm. um, like I, I was writing a lot with Alana Sweetwater, a uh, Sweetwater, um, over you know before we got it's she uh, she's a Tucson a really great Tucson singer songwriter and so I've always wanted to record some of her songs and two of those were on the already are record uh but the most but but for the most part they're they're just songs that you know I've come up with um because of what's going on in my life and what's going on in the world mm -hmm. and so much of my you know, I, I I feel like I don't know that I'm different so much, but I have always been able I've always felt like I was able to 
convey my my emotions and my my heart and my soul through this kind of cinematic lens rather than just going into you know i've i've struggled with just going into writing about you know like a love love songs about emotions and 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 you know how i feel about somebody or or um it's I, I just have, you know, that when I sit down to write, the things that come into my head are, are things that are visual, in addition to emotional. And so, so like, uh, um, you know, that song on Already Are, the Oklahoma City. I was, I was uh, just about was, to mention it to you. That was, you know, we went to Oklahoma City and played, and um, we went to that museum where they, where they, that was blown, you know, on the spot that was blown up and 165 people were killed and a whole bunch of kids. And, um, and it was a, you know, profoundly disturbing experience. And uh, I tried to, I tried to write about it and I couldn't uh, for a long time. And then it was during that time already our record came out that uh, it it really resonated, and all of a sudden it came uh, yeah. came out, yeah. And so uh, it kind of it kind of depends. And then there's uh, you know there's other songs on there that uh, on already are that I have had around for years that I've never been able to uh, kind of complete or. And so a lot of my when I start working on a record, there'll be a lot of things that'll be new. And then there'll be a lot of things that ideas that have sat around in my head and my heart and on my notebook for years that just begin to come out and evolve. And, and a lot of people, yeah. they write records, they just sit down and they'll write their whole record and it'll all be new stuff. But I've never been able to do that. Yeah. Got it. Um, spe speaking of cinematic qualities, um, uh, were the movies a big part of your life growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Yeah, we had... All right, go ahead. We had, uh, two, uh, at first, we only had one movie theater in Clayton, the Luna Theater, and it's it's been re uh, resurrected again. <laughs> and I used to go, uh, you know, Movies would come through, unlike today and nowadays when they're just all over the place. A movie would come through and it was like, you know, yeah, it was the experience of going to a movie theater was just the It was an the event, best. right? It was like yeah. something out of the ordinary. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it was a big part, big part of my life. And... um um, you've uh, under the sun, which is your latest record from 2019. Um, uh, again, huge cinematic qualities to the songwriting, and you have shot three video clips for three of the songs off of the album. And um, um, I was wondering if uh, you got something out of making those videos uh, that you have not experienced when writing the songs. Oh yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I had, uh, I've been wanting to make music videos for a long time, and then during the pandemic, um, after I had recorded that record, uh, uh, under the sun, uh, I thought, you know, I need to really apply myself and uh, learn how to work with a, with all the great video editing software that's out there. So I got Final Cut Pro, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and through the tutelage of uh, my uh, of Duncan Stitt, the guy that recorded that record for me, engineered it. Uh, he and I um, made it made one video of uh, "Love Is Everywhere," and then and then we made another one together of uh, that I sort of I kind of did half of it, and we worked. He did half of it. Uh, writers on this train, and then. Uh, and then my wife and I made uh, "Long Way from Home," mm -hmm. which is that uh, that video that won uh, the Prachida. 
at the okay. Prasida Film Festival won the best international music video. Yeah. Uh, and I, I thought <laughs> when I when I started thinking about making videos that my songs are so cinematic that I could make a lot of great videos because it that it helps me. Um, making videos kind of helps me it kind of helps flesh the songs out for some reason you know it gives them a new sense of life and I thought wow you know I could they're so cinematic I could make videos and the videos could give these songs that have been around say like the man called someone mm -hmm. I made that and like I wrote that and recorded that in 1997 I mean that's twenty five years ago. Yeah, twenty six years. You know? And to give, them, uh, to give them a new life, right? To give them a new life, and then I thought, well, that's a great thing to be able to give them a new life and get more people to listen to them. And then I thought, well, I'm starting to get, I'm, I'm getting old, and, uh, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm still playing a lot, and I'm, and uh, Kevin and. And us are going to start touring a lot more here, starting this fall. And I'm really looking forward to going out and playing. But I thought, you know, I got to. I have to admit, my days are going are numbered. I mean, everybody's days are numbered. But as you get older, you're going to reach a point where you're just not going to be able to do it anymore. And I thought, oh, I could see myself, you know, being an old, really old guy having all these great cinematic songs and making videos of them, even when I can't go out and sing anymore. Yeah. And I thought that mm -hmm. would be a really cool, you know, a really cool thing to do to kind of extend my, the life of the songs. Yeah. Uh, um, they could, they could, it's, they're going to be out there and they're going to be speaking on your behalf. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Through the visuals. So I, I haven't done, I, I haven't done a music video now for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I but I'm, I I'm learning the one next. Learning more about recording uh, now, so my focus is that. But I've got a lot of footage that I'm going to be, I'll be putting back in to work in here and pretty soon. So I'm, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back into doing more music videos. Well, I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. So. <laughs> Um, your blood brother was uh, Michael Blake, uh -huh. and he was a poet, he was a novelist, he was an environmentalist, and uh, Brothers on the Run, uh -huh. song from Under the Sun, was, uh, it was clearly like it was, it's about your friendship with him, yeah. right? Uh, I was wondering, how did you end up meeting Michael, and like what made you two connect on such a deep level? Uh, well, we met at a pizza parlor in Roswell, and my sister, I was still in Portales going to college about 90 miles north of Roswell, and my sister had moved down to Roswell with my parents, and she was finishing up high school, and she was dating an Air Force guy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I was down there that summer in 1965, and uh, uh, they were going out to have pizza one night, one Saturday night, at Johnny's Pizza Parlor. And uh, um, and I, she said, why don't you come along with us? And so I went down there, and there were some, these it's a bunch of Air Force guys, and it was Michael was there, and Michael was uh, in the Air Force at the time. And... Uh, and he and I started talking, and we real we found out right away that we were both born on the same day of the same year, and uh, so we immediately kind of connected with each other, and then we both had this artistic kind of thing. We were both listening to the same, you know, same kind of music and. And um, so we just became friends. And every time I came to down to Roswell, we'd get together and we made a little tape of uh, of songs. And 
and that my sister was kind of narrating and Michael was narrating and I was singing and it was all really terrible. <laughs> but it was like, we were like so full of life and creativity. Yeah. And uh, and he, you know, uh, he and I had a band, was just building a band at that time. And he was really encouraging it and, you know, going, you know, being really supportive like he's always been. You know, God, John, you're great. You know, just you got to you got to put this song in your band. Listen to this song. You know, there's a there's a new group coming out called The Doors, and I heard some of their stuff. And you got to put one of their song. You know, uh, are you doing a, a song by Love? Well, no. Well, you got to do. You know, <laughs> and and we would learn Donovan songs together and Dylan songs, and so so we, we just connected emotionally and yeah. artistically in a really deep way and it never it just never ended um, uh, what are some of the most like significant memories of Michael that have stayed with you and will always stay with you hmm uh well I mean, the first thing to come to mind is when he died. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, you know, really, he he got he had dementia, and uh, and he was had really slowed down a lot because of all because of the cancer <clears throat> that he had and uh, all the chemo and the treatments that he went through in the eighties and nineties and beyond and uh, uh, and and so he you know he his body just wore out. But um, he was he was so inspiring because um, he was so at peace in many ways about his life that he was unafraid to die. And he kind of carried that, you know, like that uh, that famous line from um, I can't remember Dustin Hoffman movie with the 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 Native American chief goes, "It's a good day to die." Mm -hmm. Um, and then woke up he didn't quite die and he woke up because the rain hit him in the face and was like oh I guess it's not time <laughs> but Michael had that um, had that sense about him that he was like okay about dying and mm -hmm. it was amazing cause, because I'm totally afraid to die I don't yeah. want to die yeah, me too. and I don't want to leave this earth and everything but he was like he was like okay with it and um, and when he finally died um I I had I my wife and I were we were really involved with helping to get rid of all the wild horses he had at his place and and, and it was a kind of a mess at the time but but he was uh he was in uh, in hospice and and uh, we'd go visit him and and uh I went in that last day and and uh saw him in his room lying on the bed totally still and I was like really upset that um, that nobody was there with him. He was just there and nobody in the hallway or anything. And so I went out to the front and said something and the, and the lady at the desk, she said, uh, sir, Michael is dead. And it was like, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was, it was actually a perfect ending because, because he was lying there in peace dead and i didn't even really know it and uh that's it and it was it, it's you know maybe sounds morbid but it was a great uh it was a great ending uh for him in that way and uh and then uh i guess the other i don't know the other memory that just comes in uh is us at that um you know that that when i wrote brothers on the run uh, we were both 19, 20 years old, and we were hitchhiking back and forth between Roswell and Portales and other places, too. We caught a train one time out of Clovis, headed for California. Uh, we were full of life that way, and um, and we were hitchhiking back to Portales in the middle of the night, like at midnight, and uh, 
uh, it was in the winter. It was cold. We didn't have any. We didn't have any cigarettes. We were out of cigarettes. We didn't have anything, any alcohol to drink. <laughs> we didn't have anything. We didn't didn't even really have jackets. But we, it's, you know, we, at that time in our lives, it just didn't matter. And this car comes driving by in the middle of the night and kind of slows down. We think they might be picking us up, but they don't. And a guy uh, or whoever's inside rolls down the window and flips out a cigarette. Uh, and it, and it's kind of like in slow motion, you know. <laughs> there we are in the darkness as the car is taken off. And this cigarette, we can see the ash yeah. in the darkness, you know, going yeah. up. And as it hits the highway, and we're both like, thinking to ourselves, oh, my God, I hope it didn't go out. <laughs> you know, so we ran down and got a, ran down the highway. And there it was. It was still smoldering. And it was long enough so we could each take a couple of drags off of it. Mm-hmm. Just We just, you know, Great we image. just loved it. We just like, we were so free and so, so full of life and so, you know, so open uh that that you know uh, that that was michael you know he was that way his whole life he lived that way his whole life and uh you could see it in when he became famous and won that academy award and and uh his life you know was it wasn't perfect by any means but but he 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 spent a lot of his money and his effort and his time to you know, he went to libraries to help kids. Yeah, I know. Promote reading, you know, when he was be on a book tour, and he spent a lot of money helping to save wild horses and educate yeah. people about wild horses and wild burrows. And he supported uh, all sorts of groups and anybody that was you know that he put his he spent tons of money, gave it away to groups and supporting and spoke eloquently on behalf of wild animals and wild horses and wild burrows and and uh saving wildlife and promoting book reading and he, he was a selfless person that way so a lot of great memories thanks for sharing those john um uh i'm trying to like get my set together here but you and i have a couple of things in common <laughs> we were both born in in uh, at the beginning of at the beginning of July. Oh, born, you're a kid. Oh, what's your day? On the second of July. Oh. Uh-huh. And, and your video clip for "Long Way From Home" won the international music video category at the 2021 Prasida Film Festival uh, in Italy, my country. So two things in common, right? Yeah. Uh, how did receiving an award for for a song so steeped in American um, culture and reality from a country so far away from yours uh, make you feel? Well, I wasn't surprised at all, okay. um, because uh, I don't. You probably I don't know if you knew this, but uh, that very first record solo record I made, "The Man Called Someone." Yes. It was released in Italy on uh, uh, Club de Musique Records. I didn't know that. Yeah, it know. was out there, and it got it was just got all these amazing reviews from uh, Buscadero and and, mm-hmm. uh, and and several newspapers out there. They just had so many great things. They really got the record in Italy. Really really got the understood the record whereas over here it just never except for in tucson it became really popular here in this area in southern mm-hmm. arizona but the rest of the country just it was just too simple and too folky and everything but the but the italians got it and it was amazing you know i i had a good relationship with uh I can't remember the guys' names now, but uh, they were really passionate about it and sent it out all over. And and uh, so it wasn't surprising when I heard back from from the the director of the Proceed of Film Festival 
Um, and she, and she said, well, it just was, um, the, um, what was, how did she put it? It was the simplicity of it in black and white. Um, but also the story that needed to be told. Yeah. Yeah. Especially during these times, I, I, yeah. I believe that. And, uh, so I, as far back as I've been familiar with you, and your songwriting, um, I've always responded very uh, powerfully to your soulfulness and your empathy towards fellow humans, which comes across in your songwriting and your songs and your music. Um, yours, I feel, is a is a humanistic point of view uh, on life and long way from home is such a clear example of that. So uh, my question for you is, uh, what do you feel the world needs more of these days? Oh, uh, um, more love, to put it simply, yeah. That answers the questions brilliantly. Um, uh, oh, and I wanted to tell you, while we were still on Italy, just one more thing. Another person, he's an American, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really interesting. He he uh, He's the head of a, a label that I'm on right now, the Creative mm -hmm. and Dreams Music Network. Uh, and uh, But he, as a, he grew up in Naples and Rome. Okay. And, uh, and, and is just as, as Italian as any American could possibly be. Yeah. And so I've got this strong connection with so, Italy and some, for some reason or another. So it's no wonder. I, uh, no, uh, it really isn't. And, um, um, by the way, uh, uh, if you do ever come over, hit me up. You'll be okay. my, you'll be I, my I, guest. I I'd love to. I was just thinking about it. I'd mm. love to show you around, and you're gonna be you'll be my guest, and take you to fine dining places, you and your family. All right. Okay. Um, in the there's a documentary on the making of Dances with Wolves, which was shot in 2003, and it's called The Creation of an Epic. Mm -hmm. And in that, Michael Blake said, and I'm quoting him, I'm quoting him uh, he, say, he said of himself and his friends, we were nobodies who were, who were trying to be somebodies. Since the both of you had aspiration of like breaking through into the arts in a way, uh, did you guys use to help each other with your uh, um, respective writing, uh, exchanging ideas maybe? When you were coming up on the scene, no, not not really. I mean, we supported each other. All right. Like if Michael was working on stuff, like when he was uh, <clears throat> he was writing Dances with Wolves um, in L.A., uh, he didn't really have any place to live, so he stayed with us uh, often and uh, wrote there and would read stuff to us and I would always comment on it and he would always and it, it's been that way throughout our lives where he would always read me stuff and I would comment on it and I would always play him stuff and he would either resonate with it or not but we bounced ideas off of each other but we never really wrote um, together or oh, okay we never really edited each other's work or whatever. We both just, we kind of served a, uh, as a springboard, jumping off place, uh, um, uh, support, um, um, particularly when we, when any, either of us was down about our lives or careers or whatever. We were always, always there for each other. Um, you two teamed up for a, um, a documentary in 2008, which is called The American West, On the Road with Michael Blake. You, um, you provided the music for that alongside the fellow Modern West uh, musician Teddy Morgan. 
-hmm. And um, what was it like working with Michael, who was hosting the documentary? And like, how did you go about creating the music for that? And well, they they really just took stuff from our original <clears throat> recordings. We didn't right. really write anything new okay. for it. Uh, but uh, but um, I had a really strong connection uh, with a guy who made who filmed it with Michael John uh, John Carver mm -hmm. of Wolf Productions because John and I had worked together and put we put together a video uh, before that uh, of Superman 14 for Ke the Kevin band. Yeah. But Kevin, we put a ton of work into it, but Kevin didn't like it. So it never <laughs> went anywhere. Uh, I got it. But I became John. John was familiar with my music and his John and his wife, Jody, both of whom worked on the American West. And, and uh, so I had a strong connection with them. And, uh, and went out to the uh, shooting of it um, a couple of different times and talked with Michael about it. And and uh, it was a great documentary. But the music to it was just was just taken from maybe, I can't remember exactly, but some instrumental tracks, mm -hmm. uh, some tracks that uh, had uh, that had words and vocals on them, but that were removed and just utilized. With just the instrumentation, hmm. I've uh, I've always wanted to to watch it, but I've never been able to get my hands on it. Uh, so I'm gonna try harder to find it. So um, I'm I should still have a copy of it here um, that I could get to you. It's so I, hard I, you to... know, there were there were some. Uh, um, I'm just writing it down. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, I, I'm not really sure, no. but uh, I think there were some. Um, there were some conflicts that happened between Michael and John, and mm. right after that, um, that that kind of slowed a lot of stuff down in terms mm. of getting it out to the public. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I think that, that you know, it was, uh, I, it just, it wasn't a smooth landing, let's say. Mm. Okay. Um, another project that you, that dealt with Native Americans and that you lent your talents to uh, was the Dances with Wolves, 18 years prior this one and the screenplay for the movie of course was adapted by Michael Blake himself based on his novel and uh, do you recall when was the first time that Michael talked to you about this the, this idea that this germ of this idea that he had and what did you think of it at first uh, I thought it was a great idea and uh he had had it in his mind for for a long time about uh because he was such a western guy uh, he was a scholar right of native americans he was so passionate yeah. about it well and the and then the, the the whole interaction between american white culture and the native american culture the con the the interaction between them And that uh, there were men and women, white men and women, who who actually became more um, more Native American than than white. And he was Michael was, you know, was really reson that resonated with him. And uh, and the, there were uh, there's all sorts of different kinds of Native American cultures. So not to lump them all in one, all all the nations into one. But there was a, you know, there was a sense, a sensibility in the in, in the Native American minds here in, in the Americas of, uh, of how to relate to God and to nature and that we just don't have yeah. for, for the most part. That's right. And, and they resonated in a whole different way with 
the sky and the earth and the animals and people and and uh and and michael that res michael resonated that same way and uh and so it was it was not surprising that he would come up with a an idea of a you know a white soldier out in the middle of the getting stuck out in the middle of the american west and eventually becoming more native american than white mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so so it was you know when the idea came up and we, he was floating it around uh all of us the friend all of his friends were you know like oh that's a great idea so and michael the way he is he just was always asking you know can i read this to you you want to hear this oh yeah i got a new part here i want to show i want to see what you think about it. He was always asking for input, which was great. Feedback and, right. Yeah. Uh, when you and Michael moved to LA in the early 80s, right? Um, you joined an acting workshop. Uh-huh. And um, you met and befriended various different people there. Uh, could you tell me a bit more about that group of people and how, you know, the the atmosphere in that was like um the aspirations yeah uh well it was built by michael blake and jim wilson and they had both uh, moved down just a, a few months before i did move down to la from the bay area and uh jim wilson you know of course was has you know ended up being kevin's movie producer mm -hmm. for a lot of his major early major films and uh and Michael and Jim wanted to wanted to uh, accumulate actors and and uh, artistic people around them when they got to L.A. and and Michael moved into a warehouse uh, in downtown L.A. and was living there and uh, and it was owned by two brothers who were actually, uh, I won't get into that. That's a little, that's another story, but, but they gave kind of gave him a spot in their warehouse for free because they, they supported the arts and they really liked Michael. So Michael lived down there and then he and Jim and I, and a couple of other people, we built a stage down there. Uh, we convert, we put in some lights. We, cause we were all pretty handy. And, uh, and so we got this, and they started advertising and get, getting people down there to actors down there that we would meet and musicians who might want to be actors like John Doe of X. He was oh, part of it. For a while. And, uh, uh, and so there were just a bunch of people, friends that, that were wanted to be involved in theater and, you know, in movies. And, uh, and I, I kind of wanted to act also. I I had uh, been a musician and never thought about being an actor, but I was bitten by the bug too. And I thought, oh, I, I could do this. You're a chameleon. And, you said that yourself. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, very cinematic uh, qualities. And and, uh, and so, <clears throat> so that was, you know, so that went on for quite a while until they, scrape together the money to make a movie. Right. And I mean, it didn't end then, but they got together an, enough money. I think it was $30,000 from a lot of private donations and they had a movie they wanted to make. And uh, they discovered Kevin Costner on the, who was uh, <laughs> at the time they, they met Kevin. Um, Kevin had, he was living down in, uh, in Compton, I think, or down in Orange County. And, uh, and he, he had just broken the news to his, to his wife, Cindy, that, and his parents that in spite of going to school, going to college and having a business degree, he wanted to be an actor. Hmm. And, uh, and it was devastating for everybody in his family, but he was determined and he used to drive his, his VW bus up to Hollywood every day and sit at the parking lot at the 
at the corner of Sunset and La Brea and sit in the parking lot where there was a, uh, a payphone. With an, you know, he'd park his VW van right by the payphone and use the payphone as his office phone. Yeah. And so he would call people and, uh, and then, and he'd call back and he call, he would just stay there all day long in his van. And when he'd get a call, he would pretend it's like his office. <laughs> he, he was a character or is a, still is a character. Uh, but anyway, they met. They met Kevin and auditioned him, and uh, they were they came back one day and said they found this guy who's going to be the star of their movie, who was a uh, cross between Robert De Niro and Jackson Brown, and it was this guy named Kevin Costner, and so he started coming to the workshop, and uh, we, we, it became really apparent right away that he was like really good, and he could sit. Uh, Kevin could sit at a, on on stage and we could do a scene. That's what we used to do a lot, but find a scene from a play or a movie. And uh, each of us would get up and do the same scene and try to figure mm-hmm. out different ways of doing it and how each person would do it differently. Kevin, he could sit up there and have each of us come and act with him on this, on a particular scene, and he could change the nature of the scene every time, to, from being super dramatic to being super scary to being comedy. He, it was he was pretty amazing, and uh, and so that's you know that's the story of that, and then and, and then uh, you know um, and then Michael had 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 been working on had written the book dances or was writing it at that time and uh um and uh and as time went on and it it was really funny because they could never uh jim wilson really loved the idea also of the book and they they thought it would be a perfect thing because as as the 80s went on Kevin, of course, became started to become more and more famous, yeah. and they wanted to uh, wanted him to uh, look at Dances with Wolves as a project of his. But it took him almost two years to read the book because mm-hmm. he just at that stage in his life uh, he was more you know he was he, he I guess he wasn't reading that much anyway. Once he finally read it. Uh, he thought it was it would be an amazing movie, and uh, and Michael by that time had moved to Bisbee, Arizona, and it was sick of Hollywood, and mm. uh, figured that he was never going to make it out there, and then he gets a call from Kevin saying he wants to he wants to make the movie. And by that time, Kevin was was had done a couple of things like the Untouchables and Bull Durham, Untouchables and. And, I mean, he had he had every yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, it's an interesting, interesting story. But it all started at that little workshop. Yeah, that's Maybe. yeah. That I really wanted to know more about that because I've only read about it. It's, it's, it's there's so little about it out there. But that workshop and hearing from, hearing about it from somebody who was there and lived and lived it it's, it's thrilling for yeah, me it was it was very it was really vibrant and john and, uh, Doe, right also uh, john Doe was there also yeah uh, and uh and it was uh with kevin and i i i had the band going and he used to come out and hear my band all the time and we <laughs> joke about it. uh we still joke about it that when we met, he was an actor who wanted to be a musician, and I was a musician who wanted to be an actor. Be an actor. <laughs> and so that was, you know, here we are still. Uh, I had a small role in his new movie, so I'm still have my finger in it a little bit. You but here we great, are. By the way, you look super distinguished. I saw <laughs> the picture. Such a Western character. With the costume on and the beard. Yeah, Dr. Bowman. Awesome. I saw the picture that you put up. So, yeah. um, as I guess, 
you've already answered this, but I was wondering, uh, so you, you and Matt Kevin at the workshop there, and mm -hmm. some of your earliest recollection about Kevin and the very first time you met him, what was that like? You remember? Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was just, um, you could just have a sense about him that, that he, um, he was going places. Yeah. And I can't remember, uh, you know, one of the best, uh, I mean, it, he just had that sense of, of, uh, of, uh, he had a, he had a sense of humor mm -hmm. about life that, that I learned later came from his mom, mm -hmm. but that he never lost that sense of humor. And he also had, uh, a, a, a fearlessness about him, uh, that, that kind of transcended the whole idea of being a success or a failure. Yes. He just was like, he, he you just knew that he was going to be successful. And, and it wasn't like, you know, it was successful financially or whatever. You just knew that he was going to, you know, he, he just had a sense of destiny about him. Uh, that was, and he was so good looking. He still is, but, you know, he was in his mid to late twenties when we met, and he, he was so good looking and so, so good. At, he he was totally untrained as an actor. He didn't like go to acting school and stuff. He just had this natural sense of understanding that that the best actor is the is is the best listener, and. uh and that that's the thing that most actors and actresses miss out on is that they they're so busy acting that they forget to listen to what's going on in their you know in the and Kevin always you could tell when we would work together on stage you could tell he was always there listening to you and and as a result whatever you would be whatever interchange came about he would go with that interchange as an actor rather than, Oh, I've got to remember my lines. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he had that sense about him. And, uh, at one point before he became famous, uh, I remember a story he told about, uh, he, he, he uh, I don't even know if he had a SAG card at the time, but, um, because of some of his connections, he was asked to come in when they were reading the parts for the, for the female lead role in dirty dancing. Yeah. They asked Kevin to come in and read. And read, right. With them. And, um, and, uh, and then when, after he read with a number of different women, they asked him who was the best. And he told them, uh, and so it was like, he already, you know, even with, you know, big time people, there was that sense of some of uh, that sense of greatness about Kevin that, and I've seen it in him year after year after year yeah. as he's gotten older, that he just has this, you know, he has this charisma that the minute a camera's turned on him, he just, he's got this glow, you yeah. know, it's just, you never see him looking bad at all. Any, you know, on film, no. he just, there's just some kind of relationship he has with, with film and, and with acting that was, I can only guess at as being a, a destiny for him. So yeah. it's been incredible to watch. And the, the, what you you were mentioning the the the, list to, the listening that he does as an actor, and he has I guess this I don't know this quiet quiet intensity about him, and uh, and he he really truly when you talk to him and I, 
experience this one just one time and you experienced it all of your all of your life basically but when you talk when you talk to him he really really looks at you in the eyes and listens to you so that i guess that comes from him as a person and then translates of course into the acting i just wanted to say this i don't know if you agree with me or not but uh, i think so yeah he just really really listens to you uh, mm -hmm. and it was yeah. it was empowering to feel that for me and mm -hmm. it was inspiring also because yeah. i went like I I want to be better. I want to listen more and try to 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 have my ears more open. Well, he's always had that quality, and uh, and I think he, you know, uh, I I I met both his mom and his dad many times over the years, and his dad was a lot more shut down. He was like a, you know, he was a <clears throat> he was a worker guy. Worked on the electrical lines and and uh and but his mom had this sense of kind of generosity of spirit yeah that kevin has. and uh i <clears throat> i'm sure he got a lot of great stuff from his dad too but i always yeah. think of it you know getting that stuff from his mom and he does he'll you know he'll um stand and listen to a what a janitor has to say in the same way as listening to what, you know, the owner of the Denver Nuggets has to say. Yeah. You know, he's the same, same person. Same person. And, yeah. uh, and that, I think that's, um, oh, I think that's one of the qualities that makes him um, kind of so endearing, you know, with people because people, even people that don't know him and they just see him in film, that's what they 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 can sense that in him. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, he's, got a sense, he's got a sense of every man about him, and uh, and that's always been you know great, inspiring. You mentioned it was inspiring to you. It's yeah. it is to me also. You know, to be a better person. To be better, yes. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to to touch this with to touch uh, this subject with you and um, I know maybe few people know this but Kevin's first band was Robin Boy uh -huh. with, uh, and uh, two members of Modern West you and Blair forward yeah. were in Robin Boy and uh, I wanted to know uh, how the genesis of that band how that came to be and was there ever a tour planned uh, before the group was dismantled oh uh <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, well, it was uh, in that, um, see, I was still living in uh, in um, Hollywood at the time, and uh, so it had to have been by 84 or something like that, and uh, um, the acting thing wasn't working out. <clears throat> Uh, for me and the music, I was really frustrated, um, and uh, and I was kind of on the verge of just saying, I don't know, maybe I'm just I've just put so much effort into it. Maybe I, you know, it's not going to really work for me. And I and Kevin used to come out and see the band all the time, and he always was very supportive of stuff of, of me and of my writing and. And uh, and he and I had a conversation about it at one point, and uh, and it wasn't long after that that he called me up and uh, and asked me if if he if I would think about building a band with him. Well, actually, before that, just before that, he he invested. He and a friend put in I don't know ten thousand dollars or something like that for me to make a demo. Oh, wow. His favorite songs that he thought would, you know, maybe get me a record deal. So we made a demo, and uh, at that time he was, he was really familiar with. He he had become friends with a number of people in the in the music industry. One of them was David Geffen, mm. and so we made the the uh, the demo. He took it to David Geffen, and David Geffen didn't. He was sort of like most of the music people there at that time he didn't hear it 
And so Kevin kind of took it to a few other people that he knew and it didn't work. And so, uh, and so it was disheartening and I, you know, it was great that he invested the money. And then it wasn't long after that, that he, he said, what would you, you know, think about maybe we could do a band together. And, uh, so he was already kind of like, you know, he had done American Flyer and he was, you know, he was getting to be well known. Uh, and, uh, and I said, you bet. Yeah. And so he, uh, we got the money to do the record from, uh, a Japanese label and, uh, and they, they gave us the money to make the record. And also, um, um, uh, Kevin had to go over and, uh, and do in Japan, do some commercials, some uh, ads for Suntory beer. Yeah. They were involved in it. Uh, and also Toyota, Mr. Toyota was involved in it. And so he did some ads. We all went over to Hawaii. It was actually in Hawaii that we did the ads. And, uh, and it was all really exciting and everything. And, uh, and the idea was that Kevin was really worried about putting record out and his, his agents and all the, his manager and all the people around him were really worried about him doing a record, a band. Um, and, uh, but Kevin was sort of like, no, I'm going to do it. So <laughs> we put together the record, but uh, it was supposed to stay in Japan. Uh, only in Japan, and it wasn't going to be released anywhere else uh, to kind of test the market. And and because of all the power behind it with Tokuma Records and Suntory Beer and Toyota, yeah, we got we had a we had a number one single over there. And yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> and of course, by doing that, then it came became a target. Yeah. And so Robert Hilburn, who was reviewing. Uh, music for the LA Times. It was it was kind of it, it, an unfair <laughs> targeting because the, the the record was not released in the states, but but he wrote a scathing article about the band and entitled it "The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly." Mm-hmm. And uh, and he wrote this scathing review of our record and. Uh, and, it, and and nobody was ever able to listen to it. It was just he 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 compared it to records that have been made by Dennis Quaid and and um, Bruce Willis. Yeah. And uh, and so anyway, it was devastating for Kevin. And uh, so the band was kind of disbanded, and he. You know, and he had a fam. He had a family, and his rec- career was skyrocketing yeah. at that point. And I know all of the all of his business people around him were like, "Thank God, you yeah. get rid of the man." So it was, you know, it was. I mean, it was a good move because because it was unsustainable for him. Yeah, uh, it was tough on all on me and Blair, particularly, uh, and and Steve Appel also in the band. Because we had a European tour planned and, yeah. you know, to play in J- Japan. And we were like, you know, yeah, hoping things were really good. Uh, and then he said, I can't do it. It was just like that. It was over. So, mm-hmm. But I, uh, I want to tell you that I do own the CD. The Roving Boy CD? Yep. <laughs> And, well, I, and I also own the Modern West EP, the first one that you guys put out in 2007. Oh, the four-song EP? The four-song EP. Oh, that I was would, a good EP. It was. Every Intention was on it, Five Minutes uh-huh. from America, Red River, and uh, uh, the fourth one, the fourth song, I can't remember the fourth. The other. Long Hot Night, I think. Long Hot Night, exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry, it was just escaping me. Um, John, what's the if you had to pick just one memory, what's the one memory of being friends, talking with Kevin, hanging out with him, talking to him? Um, what's the the one the most powerful one that you say, you know, this is 
yeah, this stuck with me all these years. Oh, um, I guess it would be um, at some point um, <clears throat> I'd ask him um, <clears throat> he he had become really famous at that point and uh, I mean this may seem kind of insignificant but it was it was really supportive of me and my my career. Um, and uh, he, I, I asked, you know, I don't know why I put it this way, but I said, if you want to, if you want to be a person wants to become a millionaire, Kev, how how do you go about doing that? Hmm. And uh, and he said, well. He said, you just have to know exactly what you want and and don't deviate from it. Know exactly what you want. And uh, I mean, it, it was, it, it, you know, it was like our lives are never about money and still aren't about money, except for he's got a, you know, he's got a huge bill to pay every month just because <laughs> of the massive amount of business that he does. But so our lives were never about money, but uh, but it was about you know survival or something like that. And when I asked him that question, and uh, and he said, "You just know exactly what you want and don't deviate from it." And that always stuck with me because because uh, it made me, you know, uh, it reinforced the whole idea that you know at the bottom line exactly what I want to do is just make music, you know? And he, he knew that when he, you know, when he answered that question for me, he knew it. And, uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a great, it just, it resonated far beyond the whole idea of, well, you know, I make a million dollars. Yeah, I get it. It's never been my goal, but it was like, you know, it, I've always struggled to make money before before modern West. It was a struggle to just stay alive all the time, being a musician and and uh, and stuff and having a child and everything. So I guess maybe that was one of the reasons that it came up, uh, the million dollar idea. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, that that always resonated with me. And then, I mean, I've got all sorts of other, you know, great memories because he's he's uh he's been he supported me through through all sorts of difficult times in my life and he's never ever deviated from um from always wanting to be a part of my life and part of my music no matter what where it takes us or where life takes him or takes me we've always We've always been connected in some kind of a deep way, uh, and uh, that transcends, you know, being in a band together. I mean, it's almost like we're brothers. Yeah. So. Yeah, this impression so, of always the the feel yeah. I've always got, honestly. And yeah. when record when River of Fire was released in twenty o one, it was released through a lot of critical acclaim. And in the meantime, you won like best uh, songwriter in Tucson in 1999, if I'm not mistaken, right? And best performing artist in 2000. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. What's your own measure for success? And I guess you've just kind of answered that a second ago. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I think in my life, and I think in a lot of people's lives, I think that one thing, you know, I, I, it's uh, it's never, it's 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 all that's the way it's been with me for a long time. I've never felt like I've ever gotten what I. No, that's not the, that's that's not true. I'm really, I feel really fortunate and really lucky to be able to have been doing what I'm doing, you know, but for some reason it never seems to be enough for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
maybe that's what keeps driving you to make music to, to... yeah I, it must be you know I mean and it's not like oh I've never made enough money I've never it's and I've mm -hmm. never been recognized enough I mean I you know I I, I can totally understand I mean I've got a I've been recognized in all sorts of different ways as being a good songwriter and and um I mean John Dansmore of the yeah. doors. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean so I've just been so grateful to be able to have played and doing stuff with other musicians and keep my career going the way I have. I'm just so grateful. But I guess for me, I'm just never kind of completely satisfied. satisfied with what I'm doing. You know, I always think that I've never quite reached my potential. Mm. And uh, I guess that's, you know, that's probably a lot of people pro probably resonates maybe with a, with a lot of people that it's just never. And, and, and that's, that's okay. I mean, because that's part of what, like you said, what keeps you going, you know, keeps what you keeps going, like trying to keep trying to reach that goal that, to, to climb the mountain, the mountain. Uh, when in two, in twenty o five, I guess it was, uh, Kevin uh, got Modern West together uh, and re reunited with you and Blair Forward. Um, could you walk me through what led uh, to that band forming again? Um, oh yeah, Kevin. Uh, Kevin had uh, his career had gone, you know really well and he and I had always stayed in touch and uh but but I had um I had kind of like made an effort um during that uh, 2000s when I was building my own career again um or continuing uh, that I wanted to sort of get out from under the whole idea of you know oh you're Kevin Costner's friend oh yeah mm -hmm. Oh, you're the guy that did Dances with Wolves. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to kind of get out from under that, and uh, and so so I start. I kind of made an effort to to just play down the, the whole idea of Kevin and I playing together and having a band together and stuff. And uh, um, and then at the same time, in like 2004. And, two, and going into 2005, I didn't know it, but Kevin was trying to build a, trying to get back into music again. And by this time, he had met all sorts of great musicians and stuff. And uh, and he was trying to put a band together. And uh, he told me later, when we started playing again together, uh, his feeling was, he said, he said he went to a bunch of, a whole bunch of different people and they played practiced a lot and they tried to come up with songs because Kevin had always wanted his whole idea of being having a band was was uh always doing original material and he said after he and I got together again with Blair and started building this band he said he said it felt like he was dancing with the wrong woman nice metaphor yeah, it was a great metaphor. He said it just was like uh, it just became obvious to him that you know he that Didn't in terms right. of his musical direction, it you know it it the 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 kind of music that I wrote was what resonated with him, and so we were playing Blair and I and some other guys and Larry, the guy the drummer yep. uh, in our band now, uh, we were playing a show out in in, in California at Jim Wilson's ranch and uh and uh, Wilson was hosting a bunch of uh, was hosting some concerts out there and asked me to come out and play so we were playing out there and um uh and Tim Wilson uh, Tim Hockter Kevin's best friend uh came to see us and told me that Kevin wanted to start a band again and would I be interested in doing it and it was a real uh kind of a specific type of thing he Kevin had started had been doing a lot of personal appearances like going out and 
you know, doing a, a dinner with people and and uh, playing around to golf with some people and talking business, and they would pay him like they would they pay famous actors to come in and hobnob with people. You know, yeah. Kevin was getting tired of doing that, but it was still part of keeping his career going and keeping contacts going to for financing and stuff like that. And so he wanted to make a part of that be that if he went out and did uh, these, you know, these uh, kinds of uh, personal appearances, it would involve a band and they would have to pay for a band. So he wouldn't be just there by himself. He'd be there with the band and part of it, the, and the band would perform. Yeah. He said, we can make a lot of money. <laughs> I said, okay. Not bad, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, so and- that was the start of it, 2005, and then it's grown immensely. I mean, we still play all original music, yep. but it's grown from being being a uh, um, you know a band that goes out and does you know a personal appearance with him every now and then to you know being doing major tours in Europe and that man all we've toured all over the country, yeah. all over the world. And, yes. We're still we're gearing up for a lot more touring starting this fall too. So, um, which is great to know, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, and we I might love... even do. He's talking about doing a, a junket tour for Horizon in Europe, and he said if he can if he can make it happen, he's going to bring the band over with him. The road up ahead. Look, what does it look oh. like? Here? Oh, it uh, looks it looks endless and open and and uh, wonderful. Yeah, so I'm making I'm working on a new record now, and uh, I'm working with this label that I like a lot out of Nashville. They have a lot of connections in in Europe and particularly in England, mm. and uh, so I'm getting uh, I'm getting some airplay over there. Which is really great, uh, um, uh, and uh, and then we just were out with Kevin this last weekend. Teddy and Park and I spent some really good time with him, talking about life and stuff, and uh, and about the band. And uh, we have a we have a show booked on October twenty first in Denver, a private show. And uh, Nick, our our agent, is starting to build some shows around that. And Kevin is really excited about getting out and playing again. Um, I don't know if he's going to be doing season six for Yellowstone. That's very complicated. Uh, he'll be hopefully filming the last two of his movies. He's filmed the first two of Horizon. Mm-hmm. He's got two more to film. Yeah. Uh, but we can work around that easily, and uh, but he's he he's as energized about getting out to play now as he's ever been. So, so for me, you know, I just am um, I'm happy to be working on more music and more songs. Blair lives in town here in Tucson, as does Larry, and we see each other. Blair and I rehearse all the time, and, and so you, I've got and you play together, right? We play together, yeah, and so I've got a great little musical community here that uh, has supported me, and I feel really good about. Uh, and uh, to be reconnecting with Kevin and and the Modern West Band is wonderful because we all, with all the, the the from the very beginning in 2005, we're we're the same members. It's just Park is a new guy, yeah. the newest, but yeah. he's still been around you know, 12, 13 years, 14 years. The rest of us, you know, for going on almost 20 years now. And and we still love playing together and love hanging out together. When Teddy and Park and I went out to hang with Kevin this last weekend, we did some work, but it was more like a, almost like a spiritual retreat because we were all, we're all really focused on being, you know, trying to be better men and, uh, oh, trying to, you know, 
trying to be just really supportive of Kevin and of, of each other and our families and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, get and put music out. That's uplifting music. And, and we're just you know, really still connected in a deep way, uh, far beyond the music.